afternoon. My name is Rand Morimoto, and this session is going to be on direct access configuration, tips, piss, tips tricks, and best practices. Um, this session is a level 400 session, so this is going to be a deep dive technical on uh, direct access. Um, I'm going to go through a number of this information. The slides are available up on the uh, Microsoft uh, TechNet site, so if you go into My TechNet, you'll be able to download the slides and also the recording of these sessions. And so if I go through something quickly, you want to see it again, you're more than welcome to actually jump back up online. I think you know, it takes them two, three hours to get the stuff up on the site. But you'll actually have a copy of this stuff available. Plus, when you get home, you'll have access to this information. So um, even though I'm going to be zipping through a lot of this stuff, you'll uh, get a chance to actually look through it and what's available. Um, I am Rand Morimoto. I have worked with the Microsoft product teams for quite some time now. I'm not a Microsoft employee. Um, I run a consulting firm, and in my free time I write books, and I wrote the Windows 2008 R2 Unleashed book, um, where I have a whole chapter covering uh, direct access, and it's something that we've been working with Microsoft on from the beginning of the product and, and the development of the technology. Um, as I mentioned, as a level 400 session, there's no marketing fluff inside the system. I'm going to jump right into the installation configuration. So I have a demo system uh, on uh, the desk here that I'll be going through really the tips and tricks around uh, direct access, um, as well as UAG direct access um, on methods of configuration. I'll talk about things that work. I'll talk about things that don't work, how organizations can actually drill down and get this thing working. By a show of hands, if I can get an idea, how many of you have actually implemented direct access already in some shape or form? So a handful of you are, are here. Um, I'm assuming that for those of you who have already uh, implemented direct access, uh, you, some of you have it working, some of you have run into some of the steps. What you'll find in a lot of what I'll talk about, even including if you have direct access implemented, and I talk about UAG direct access, where that might fit into this whole process. Now, I listed on here a couple of different URL links. There's two things that are, are available for you um, as attending this session here. One is effectively a, um, a demo guide, and effectively that is what I'm going to be covering today. I'm, when I go through the step-by-step -step implementation, I'm actually going to go through, and I'm sharing you my notes of what I'm actually going to demonstrate. Because the last thing I like doing is attending a session, and you see the guy sit up stage, and he does it perfectly, because he's done it a million times, then you go back and you try it yourself and it doesn't work. And you're like, what did the guy do that I didn't figure out? And so I'm actually going to share with you out my uh, demo notes. It actually has a lot of my chicken scratch notes inside of it, along with little notes of, Rand, don't do this because it'll break uh, the demo and it will break the configurations. And so that's available for you to download. Um, and the other thing that you have available is a white paper that kind of goes through the implementation as a step-by-step -step procedure, kind of give you a background on it. So if somebody asks you more information about uh, direct access, you have information. So everything that I'm going to cover today, you will have directly available to you. I'm going to make a handful of assumptions. I'm going to make the assumption that you're kind of familiar with Active Directory and group policies. So my apologies if I go through some of this stuff and I'll basically zip through creating a group policy. Um, if you haven't done group policies uh, uh, at all, again, the step-by-step -step procedures are going to be in here. However, I'll kind of walk through that process. I'm also going to make the assumption that you have a pretty good familiarity with Windows control panel and networking that you understand TCP IP, you understand effectively where things are when you change an IP address or configuration settings, and that you have a conceptual knowledge of DNS, IPv6, and, uh, and uh, IPsec encryption. And I'll be talking a little bit more about where these fit in uh, for direct access. So kind of as this, this quick background slide as to where direct access fits in, for those of you who have not had a chance to fiddle with it, what is it? is that normally when you have a desktop system and you want a VPN into a network, you first boot the computer up, uh, you log into that local computer, you double click on a VPN, whether it's a Microsoft VPN or a Cisco VPN or whatever it is, and then once you double click and you access into the, the, the system, you have to type in another login name and password, right? So you have to log in to the VPN. So you log in first to your workstation, then you gotta log into the VPN. What direct access does is that it immediately turns on, the minute that you turn on your laptop or desktop system, it goes out and auto-negotiates to be able to connect it into this direct access server. And so no matter where you are, internet cafe or a hotel or at the airport, is that you get a Wi-Fi connection or a wired connection, and you're gonna get a secured encrypted access from your laptop or desktop all the way into the office. The advantage to this, and what we found for a lot of the early adopters and as we've been implementing direct access, is that this really helps out a lot of salespeople who need to get access to files or documents on the back end, and they kind of get confused about this. Well, when I'm in the office, I don't have to run VPN, and when I'm out of the office, I have to run VPN, and sometimes when I run VPN out of the office, I get an error because the VPN is blocked because it doesn't support TCP IP or 
point-to-point -point tunneling, PPTP for uh, routing of information. And so it really makes it easy for that executive, that salesperson, to flip on a computer, turn it on, log in locally, and it automatically connects them back to their office, and they still get their F drive and their G drive and all the different resources that are available for it. Now, one of the things with direct access is it does use IPv6 um, as part of the communications uh, as how it finds the different servers that are out there. I'll talk about that in a second here. It uses um, the ability now when you're out in a remote world and you plug it into a hotel or an airport, they're not going to give you an IPv6 address. They're going to give you an IPv4 uh, address, typical IP address that you have in the network. Built into direct access and built into actually Windows 7 is the ability to take effectively an IPv6 on the laptop, push it down into an IPv4 packet, and send it across. It's effectively what they call tunneling or the transition um, protocols that get you from your client system all the way to IPv6. That's 90% of where the problems occur, and I'll talk about that as I get a little bit later here, is that that transitioning protocols is IPv6 might be working great on your laptop, but IPv4 is what the network is talking about. How do I go through and make sure it's tunneling property? So I'll show you where those fit in. IP uh, 6 to 4 and Teredo are basically methods um, to be able to go through and encapsulate and transfer the information. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And again, the tunnel is an IPv4 tunnel, and all the communications is encrypted uh, back out to our system. Now, as I mentioned, this is running IPv6 um, as the communication standards. That's one of the areas that we find organizations, when they're playing with direct access, they get a little confused as to how to configure IPv6. Um, one of the things I found is, is when I searched the internet for anything good on IPv6, I couldn't find anything out there. There's a lot of stuff out there about the theory of IPv6, how it theoretically should work. Anytime that you ask somebody about IPv6 in a Windows environment, if the first thing that comes out of their mouth is the RFC of, yes, the RFC for IPv6 and all that, they don't know what they're talking about. If they know what they're talking about, they should be able to go through and say, it's very easy to configure IPv6 in a Windows-based environment. Easy enough to the point where I've written a blog post. I actually have six, a six-part blog post where I go through and demystify the whole idea of an IPv6 address, how you do DHCP for IPv6, just like you do DHCP um, for IPv4. I talk about DNS. I talk about routing. I talk about direct access. And so if you actually want a lesson on IPv6 and really understand how to do the addressing, um, go up to, to um, networkworld.com slash community slash Morimoto. Uh, it's a blog post that I started in January of this uh, year. So if you go back to January blog post, uh, it's a six-part series that I go through. But I'll talk about creating and utilizing IPv6 um, and then effectively how you can go through and ping and transmit information about through IPv6. So let me get into this demo environment. My implementation environment is just Windows Active Directory 2008, um, R2 Service Pack 1. I can also have uh, R2 domain controllers in this environment. I have a certificate of authority. In order for me to be able to do encryption IPv6, is uh, IPsec, I need to be able to use a certificate. And so I'll show you how I'm going to create certificates automatically, push them out to my client systems so that I can encrypt the sessions and, and the session states. I need a Windows 2008 R2 server running the direct access role. The direct access role is nothing more than kind of like making DHCP role or a Windows web server role or a Hyper-V role. It's just another one of those check boxes when you build a Windows 2008 server and you go through and select that you want the direct access role on that system. And then the client systems today that supported direct access are Windows 7 Enterprise Edition or Ultimate Edition. And so you need to be able to have that version of the uh, client uh, software uh, on your system. 32-bit or 64-bit, doesn't really matter. So the implementation environment and what it's going to look like. So I have, uh, I'll be showing you here, I have an internal environment in which I have down in the bottom there the Active Directory DNS, my certificate of authority server. I have a name server, um, NLS. Um, I have my direct access server. And if you notice my direct access server in the middle there, I have two network adapters on it. One is going from the internal network. One is going to the external network. The internal network effectively is when I'm inside the network, I have access to my LAN. When I take that Windows 7 laptop, move it out to the public network, I'm now traversing over this IPv4 network. I'm connecting through that direct access server, and I'm getting into my network. So that direct access server is nothing more than a gateway. It's basically allowing me from the public network into the private network. It's going to do all the translation for IPv6. It's going to do all of the encryption and access to the system itself. I'm going to talk about three different models here um, in how you set up direct access. One is end-to-edge. -end Another one is end-to-edge with end-to-end -end IPsec encryption. 
and the other one is end-to-end -end IPsec. And this is dependent upon the type of encryption and the type of accesses you want. In configuration number one is what I'm doing between my direct access client, my Windows 7 user, and my direct access server is at that point I'm using encryption for IPsec, and I'm using IPv6 tunneled through the environment. Effectively, I'm using IPsec to be able to encrypt the communication stream. However, from that direct access server over to all of my web, uh, servers on the internal network, the only thing that is required in this configuration is that my endpoint servers are running IPv6. They could be running Exchange IPv6, SharePoint running IPv6, my file and print server running IPv6. Um, I don't need any encryption. I don't need IPsec. In this case here, the green line for the internet is the encryption piece, and I just the endpoint needs to be running IPv6, meaning that the file servers, Exchange servers, SharePoint servers need to be running Windows 2008 for the most part as underlying operating system running IPv6. Now, a lot of you might be saying, well, wait a second, well, I have a lot of old servers running Windows 2003. I don't have IPv6 uh, running on a lot of these systems. How can I do that? Toward the end here, I'll talk about what we call direct access UAG. It's using the unified access gateway and, and visualize replacing that direct access server with a Microsoft UAG server. When I put a UAG server in that place, now my backend servers can actually be running IPv6 or IPv4. So this is in the environment where I put the direct access server in place. That assumes that all of my backend servers are going to be IPv6 uh, configured systems. In uh, configuration two, I've now gone through and I'm doing IPv6 on the connection to the internet, to the DA server, and I'm also doing IPv6 between my uh, web servers. So I'm providing better encryption better security because that means all my traffic is going encrypted uh, between the systems. And the third scenario really is a modification of that, is that it basically provides me with end-to-end -end encryption. So I'm doing IPv6 and um, IPsec all the way from my client through the direct access server to every one of my Exchange, SharePoint, and file servers. This is the highest level of security and encryption. If you're looking to build this thing for the first time and kind of fiddle with it, Configuration number one is the easiest thing to be able to do, because at that point, all you really need is you just need to have effectively a, a direct access server, and you don't have to fiddle with any of your uh, internal servers other than maybe give it an IPv6 address. But you don't have to make any changes. If you're really looking to lock this down, I typically say do configuration number one, get all that working, and when you have the direct access features working and you want to get the end-to-end -end point security, then you can go through and enable the encryption piece on that end um, for the servers. So enabling IPv6, so this gets into my step-by-step -step process. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go through and switch over to uh, my demo systems, and I'm going to walk you through uh, my demo configuration. And great, my UAG server finally came up. It's one of those things that you hate doing a demo, and as it's shutting down the demo session, it's saying it's installing one of 26 updates. And then when the demo comes up, it's kind of like still configuring the system, and it's like, well, I hope it works after it does the patch updates. So we might have a creative demo here. For some reason, one of the patches broke my demo. But then you'll be able to see me do a debugging session, huh? Um, so let me go through the, the whole configuration of, of what it takes um, to go through and set up uh, direct access. So one of the first things that I, I need to be able to do is set up uh, effectively a name server. Um, and I have, uh, and show you the different systems I have here. I have on the system a domain controller. This is internal, running Windows 2008. I have this direct access server, so this is the thing that has network adapters in both my internal and external network. I have a name server. This is an external name server, so this is on the public-facing uh, internet segment. So this will be the public DNS. I'm going to be, a little bit later in, in this session, switching out this DA server for a UAG server, so that way I can go through and show you what, what it is to be able to configure instead of using IPv6 servers on the back end. I can actually be using IPv4, my old Windows 2003, Linux servers, things of that type that are running still IPv4 on the back end system. And then I have a Windows 7 and a Windows XP workstation. And I'm going to be moving my Windows 7 workstations both internal and external to my network. So the first step I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my name server and I'm going to set up DNS. So Active Directory. And one of the things I'm also going to show you here is I'm going to go through and build these configurations. Uh, from scratch, so things like setting up DNS uh, and configuration. It's going to take me a minute here to be able to launch some of these guest sessions um, to be able to run through the, the roles. But I want to be able to kind of show you some of the role configuration. So again, there's no smoke and mirrors here. 
that you know, you, I've spent three days preparing this demo so I can go through and show you the basic configurations and say, see how easy it is? Um, and then you go back and you can't figure out how to be able to set it up because I spent three days building out a demo. So I'm gonna feel the pain here. Um, so I have DNS in this uh, system. Um, and <clears throat> I need to go through and create a zone. So I'm gonna create a, an external zone. Company, what am I using for this demo? Uh, ABC. So I'm creating DNS in that environment. And this is my external server. And I'm going to give it an IP address for my UAG server, uh, which is 12.155.166.10. And I'm also going to give it one for my DA server, which is 12.155.166.2. Um, and I'm also going to give one for my name server, which is also 12.155.166.2. So these are DNS addresses that basically on the external network, I want to hit my UAG server, my DA server, or effectively my uh, NLS, uh, my network location server. I'll talk about each one of these things in a bit here. But this basically gives my external footprint uh, access to these uh, sessions here. I'm now going to switch over to my direct access server. And on this system here, I want to be able to go through and create um, a CRL, um, Certificate Revocation List. And on this system, I'm going to go through and create a folder. And I'm going to call that CRL. Oops, helps if I type it right. CRL. And on that CRL server, I'm going to give security permissions. To be able to access uh, that um, file share on that system. Uh, let's see, next thing I want to be able to do is go into my certificate of authority. So that is on my domain controller. So I'm gonna go over to DC1. And certificate of authority on my domain controller. And this whole certificate of revocation um, list is basically when you're using direct access is that if you had a Windows 7 client that was roaming around if you determine that you know, this employee got terminated, you want to basically prevent this employee from taking their laptop and connecting into the network. And so the way that it uses, how it revokes the user, again, the user's not double clicking to log into the network, is that if they log in locally to their system, they're going to have access to your network. And so the way that we block it is we create a certificate revocation list. We basically revoke the certificate that's sitting on that laptop. And the minute I revoke that laptop certificate, that user can no longer log into my network. Um, and so that's why it's important for us to initially in here create a certificate revocation list. So that way it provides me the ability of allowing or disallowing the user's access to the system. So on uh, DC1, um, I click my CA properties. And I'm going to go into extensions. And I want to be able to create in this um, CRL distribution point. I want to basically give it a file uh, for my DA1. CRL, that's that server that I created. Um, on DA1, I created a subdirectory called uh, CRL. And I want to be able to uh, enter in my certificate name, uh, my CRL name suffix, and the delta CRLs, dot CRL. I want to publish it. So I want to basically publish my uh, CRL to that directory, which is the directory that I created, both my uh, published CRLs as well as the deltas. And it's going to say that it's going to restart Active Directory. And so now when I go into this uh, DA1 server, oops, I've got to go through and revoke it, or send out. Let me go through and publish now the CRL list. And the directory is invalid. Do I have? That, oh, I didn't share it. Thank you. Uh, I set the permissions. I forgot to share it. Thank you for those of you who are paying attention. So sharing. So let me go through and share um, that directory. So there we go. Now I should be able to set up my revoke list. And let me see. Uh, zero. I have access to it. Let me see. 
permission, security, got app run access to it. It is shared. Did I miss something in, in the, uh, yeah, let me go through and double check. So let me go back into my domain controller here. Properties, extensions, file, colon, backslash, says DA1 CRL, ah, yeah. I missed a slash. Let me go through and do a file, colon, whack, whack, backslash, backslash, DA1, backslash, CRL, backslash. There you go. Get that, get my CRL name, get my deltas, dot, CRL. Publish, publish the deltas, restart Active direct, uh, Directory Certificate Services, right click, publish, that works. <laughs> See, it doesn't work eventually. All right, so now let me go in, there it is. So there's my certificate. So what I've done is I've basically created a publicly available certificate revocation list. Um, as long as you follow the steps, um, step by step and make sure that you don't have any typos in the configuration settings. It's now going to go through and publish that on my external port of my uh, CRL server. Now, as I start going through this process, it's going to ask me what is the, the CRL for this. So that way the system can check. If it's not on the CRL list, it allows that remote system into the network. So that gets through that piece there. Next section. All right. So, uh, starting direct access, uh, configuring, I said that. So the next thing I need to be able to do, go through and do, actually I can pop into my demo slides here. So what I've done uh, for step number one now is I need to go through on all of my domain controllers, run a command, it's actually not a PowerShell command, it's just a DOS command, um, DNS command, slash config, slash global query block list at WPAD. What it is, is I'm effectively going to go through and set it up so I can enable using ISOTAP. Um, for configuration. So this is one of those transition protocols that gives us IPv6 into IPv4 um, through that process. So from there, on my domain controller, uh, DNS command slash config slash global query block list space WPAD. Uh, next configurations, domain controllers. Uh, I've already set up my DA1, I've already set up my CRL. Oh, I need to be able to go back to my name server and I need to add the CRL, which is 12.155.166.2, which is exter external port. So now my CRL is if I'm sitting on the outside of the network and I hit crl.companyabc.com, it's going to go through and check the CRL list uh, on my system. Um, next thing I need to be able to go through and do, pop back into my slide deck. Just come forward. Um, either I, and, and for those different settings, I can go through and either enable using ISOTAP, which is what I just did, or I can actually get an appliance, um, which does NAT64. It's basically an appliance that does the 6 to 4 conversion uh, from the system. That works great assuming that the network connection that you have um, on both ends are six to four conversions and you have these appliances for your remote user who plugs into a, a hotel or an airport or whatever, they're not gonna have an appliance there. So this is a nice idea, maybe from your server end, but on the client perspective, you need to be able to go through and do some type of, of transition uh, protocol from the client side. For the network location server um, and creating the group. So the next step that I'm actually going to go through and walk through is the process of creating the groups and the security groups to identify who's going to be a, a direct access uh, client. Now there's a couple of ways I can do this. One way is I can go to every one of the computers, laptops and desktops, configure it for direct access, configure it for IPv6, configure the CRL. I can manually go through and do it. What I'm actually going to go through and do is show you group policies. So I can basically set it up so that I set a group policy for the group of users, group policy for the group of computers, and I push those policies out to each one of my computer systems. So that way, um, from a policy basis, I can set the configurations. So in that case there, let me go through Active Directory, my domain controller. Uh, and Active Directory users and computers. And from Active Directory users and computers, I'm going to go through and create a group. 
And I'm going to call this group uh, direct access um, clients. I'm going to make it a universal group. So a universal security group. And within that universal security group, I'm going to add in WS3, which is effectively my Windows 7 workstation. Oops, I've got to go through and specify computers. And so now I'm basically adding this WS3, my Windows 7 workstation here. So this Windows workstation is known as ws3.companyabc.com. I'm basically adding that computer into this group. A little bit later, what I'll show you is I'm going to go through and set up a policy to be able to give that uh, uh, system access uh, to my uh, network. I'll go into now Group Policy Management Console, GPMC. And now this is where I'm going to start setting up those uh, policies that I'm going to push out. And I'm going to create a group policy. And in this group policy, I'm going to call it my direct access group policy object. Edit. And within that group policy object, Windows, Security. Um, and I'm going to go into the firewall settings. And what I need to be able to do in all of the systems that are going to communicate with uh, direct access is that I need to open up the firewall port to provide um, ICMP echoing. Uh, and again, I can go to every one of these Windows 7 laptops and make the configuration changes where I open up a firewall port. A lot of times what I find, um, and, and when I've gone through and looked at direct access configuration, is that you Google this particular problem, I can't get it working. And what you'll typically find is, is that a lot of the Google hints are turn off firewall on your laptop. That works. Um, it definitely will work um, once you open up all the firewall ports on your firewall and on your laptops. But it's probably not the best thing to be able to do. All we're opening up is ICMP. And so again, I could do it on every single laptop, every single um, direct access server. Or what I'm effectively going to go through and do is I'm going to create a group policy using a rule. And from there, I'm going to go through and set up a custom rule um, for all programs. And it's an ICMP rule that I want to specifically want echo to be allowed by any IP address, allow the connection for no matter whether I'm inside, outside of the domain. I'm going to call this inbound ICMP before echo. I'm also going to go through and set up a rule. And again, all of this stuff is in the step-by-step -step guide that I provide you. So even though I'm kind of zipping through this relatively quickly, you have all the information in the guide. Oops, I missed a step there. Oh, custom rule. Uh, all programs for ICMP for V6. And I allow echo for that. And I call this uh, inbound ICMP v6 echo. And now I need to be able to set it for outbound, allowing ICMP as well, custom programs. ICMP v4, customize for echo, next. This is where I um, need to be able to stop. Now, be, by default, this is where a lot of people, as you're going through the configuration and you follow my guide, you click next, 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 next. Look on here what the default is. The default on this is blocked by default. Um, you actually have to open it up, and so you have to allow by connection. So just one of those gotchas as you're going through this whole thing. Don't zip through the next too quickly, is that you actually have to go through when you're doing the outbound configuration to allow the, con uh, the connection. Otherwise, you will do everything perfectly. You'll push the policy out, and then you'll open up all the firewall ports later because you couldn't figure it out. But it's usually that place right there as you're blocking it. So I'm going to set this as an outbound ICMP v4 uh, echo. Um, and then the last one is to do the exact same thing of setting up a custom rule <clears throat> for all programs. And ICMP v6, customize, echo. Um, and again, changing from block to allow. 
then I'm going to say outbound ICMP v6 echo. All right. So I've now gone through and set up a group policy for all of my systems um, on the, my network. I'm going to go out to my Windows 7 computer system. And I'll show you control panel, system, firewall. I'm going to go into the advanced settings. And when you look at the inbound rules, the inbound rules are going to have branch cache and core networking, and same with the outbound. I'm actually going to go through and run GP update slash force. I'm actually going to go through and force a, uh, a group policy pull. Uh, you could wait 90 minutes, and by default, group policies push every 90 minutes to the system. I could reboot that computer. Um, that will bring the policies uh, in as well. Or you just go through and do a GP update slash force. And now what will happen is there you go. My inbound um, echoes have applied and my outbound have applied. Okay, so that's, again, I can go to every one of my computers and open up every firewall port, which is a bad thing. I can go to every one of my computers and manually do this, or I set a group policy and push that group policy out. So that's all I went through and did is set it up so that my systems will provide um, group policy access. Next thing I want to be able to go through and do is set up um, certificates uh, on my system. I have to be able to go through and do IPsec encryption. In order for you to be able to do encryption, you have to have keys on both ends. I have to have a client key, I have to have a server key, I have to encrypt the information and send the information back and forth. And so the way that I, I basically go through and do that um, is through uh, using certificates in Active Directory. So on my domain controller, Active Directory, uh, certificate templates, So certificate templates. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate the default web server template. And uh, effectively, I'm creating a web server to be able to go through and set up the certificates. So I'm going to specify to duplicate that. Um, since I have Active Directory 2008 and I'm running it on a 2008 enterprise server, I'm going to specify 2008. If I'm running it on 2003, I can specify 2003. Now remember, your direct access server is going to be a 2008 or 2008 R2 server. And so in that case there, I'm going to set it as a Windows 2008 um, enterprise server. Um, and I call this a web server 2008 um, as my system. I'm going to go into the security tab. And I'm going to specify inside here for my, I add in here uh, domain computers. And two things that I want to be able to do, both for my authenticated user and my domain computers, I want to basically enroll them in Active Directory policies. So it's currently have a read. I'm going to specify to enroll. And same thing with the computers. And what this is going to do by, by setting up this uh, uh, certificate is it's basically going to allow me to do auto-enrollment certificates. It basically allows me to create a policy, create a certificate, and push that certificate out to the system using a group policy. Um, again, a very simple way for me to be able to get certificates out to all of my different domain controllers or certificate uh, uh, web servers, my DA servers, things of that type, um, as well as my clients. Uh, let's see, request handling. Um, I want to go through and allow the private key to be exported. What else do I need to do? I think that's it. I always have to double check so I don't skip something and then the whole demo doesn't work. I think that's it. I say OK. Um, Then I'm going to go through and to my certificate of authority, which is already running here somewhere. There's my certificate of authority. I'm going to go to my certificate templates. I'm going to do a certificate template to issue. Go out and grab my web server 2008. So I created this template. I set it to enroll. I'm going to go through and add that in there so that now my web server 2008 um, uh, template has now been issued uh, is inside my system. And I think that's all I need to be able to do at this point in, in the configuration. All right, so now what I want to be able to do is set a group policy to push these certificates out. So back to my Active Directory group policy management console. I create a new, is there a question there? Okay. I'm going to create a new group policy and I'm going to call this now uh, cert auto enrollment um, group policy. 
my cert auto enrollment. I'm going to edit that. Go into policies, windows, uh, security settings. And I'm going to go into public key policies and automatic certificate request settings. So this is my auto enrollment uh, functions. I'm going to create a new automatic certificate request. Um, I want to create a computer certificate. And it now adds it in so that I set a policy that is going to push out certificates, a computer certificate, to all of the different member servers that I'm going to identify a little bit later here. Uh, let's see, did I get everything in this one? Automatic certificates, certificate templates, group policy editor. All right, so now I'm going to go into my DA1 server. And I'm going to do a GP update slash force on that system there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring over certificates to this computer system. There it is, certificate, um, the group policies have applied. I'm going to go into MMC, add certificates for my computer. And there it is. It went through and created a certificate called DA1, issued today. Um, and it is a client authentication and server authentication certificate. So I created the certificate process. I created a group policy. I went through and added the group policy. I pushed it out. I ran GP update. Now my direct access server has a certificate. If I go through and bring in workstations, the workstations are going to get certificates. All of my computers are effectively going to go through and get a certificate. In fact, if I go into my Windows 7 computer, I'm going to have to go through and run a GP update slash force on that system again. And now what it's going to do, it's going to go grab a computer certificate out of the, the certificate store, and it's going to have a certificate. Now I have a certificate on my client side. I have a certificate on my server side. And now I can go through and do the IPsec encryption. So again, you can manually do all of this stuff. You can walk through the process. I actually give you a step-by-step -step process on how to do it manually. The manual process is 43 pages. The step-by-step -step process using group policies is six pages. So um, group policies are very helpful when you're trying to go through and deploy this uh, to systems. All right, I have that ready to go. Certificates are in place. Now the next thing I want to be able to do is actually start installing the uh, direct access role. It's actually it's a feature, so I'm going to go into my direct access server, click on features. And actually, you know, while that thing's thinking there, which I just figured out how to think, let me go through my slides and make sure where I've gotten. So um, configured the name server. I've created my direct access group. That was that security group that I added WS3, the uh, Windows 7 client system to. Um, I did that uh, Windows firewall. So that was the echo for ICMP. I went through and configured that as a group policy, pushed that out. Um, I now created those uh, certificates by setting up a group policy. I've now pushed out certificates. Um, it's now reminding me I've got to actually put in a uh, certificate on the no, uh, network location server, so I've got to go through and do that. I do the certificate auto enrollment, and step seven, which is effectively now configuring the direct access server. So again, these processes, they just kind of, you follow the, the guide, you step on through it, and as long as you don't do typos, the thing works. All right, features. Let me go through and add features. Uh, direct access management console. Next, an install. And the interesting thing about this is that it's nothing more than a console um, that's being installed. It's not a massive role and a lot of files and stuff like that. Direct access is nothing more than just um, a encrypted IPsec, um, IPv6 stuff that's already built into a web server. And so all the console is going to do is, is help us configure effectively the encryption and the routing of information on the system. So it's installed the role. And now when I go into my features, under direct access, there's two things. There's setup and monitoring. I'll click up on setup. This is the first time I'm setting this thing up. And in this uh, screen here, let me open it up a little bit more here. It goes through, and there's step one, step two, step three, step four, and then a save button. So basically, all you do is you kind of walk through this thing. It won't allow you to go to step two until you get step one configured right. So the first thing I'm going to do is specify my remote clients. So this goes back to that group policy that I added my WS3 system to. 
is that I, can, I want to be able to go through and add effectively my clients. And I called that, what was it, uh, direct access, something or another. I don't know, direct access clients. Um, as I, uh, when I set this up, the, these are the systems. All the systems in this group are what direct access is going to allow in. So while I put W3 in there, if I have WS4, WS5, WS6, all I go through and just do is add those workstations into this group. And by default, since uh, the direct access server is going to allow that group of computers to route through it, all I have to do is just drag the users, uh, the computers into that system. So that's the first step. Very simple, add the, the uh, group of computers. Second step is configuring the direct access server. Now one of the things that you'll find here is that it'll automatically identify your external network adapter and your internal network adapter. And if I go into uh, my networks, you'll see here that I have external and internal. My internal is obviously for my internal network, it's a 192.168 internal address. Uh, and my external has a publicly addressable 12.155 address uh, for it. One of the things that you'll find in my configuration notes, my preparation notes, is that the external network adapter has to have two I publicly available IP addresses that are consecutive. You'll notice here that I have um, 12.155.166.2 and 3. It is a requirement in direct access uh, to be able to go through and configure it with these two consecutive IP addresses. Um, it has to do with the routing that is required. I'll talk about the routing a little bit later, but it does require two consecutive 2.3 or 155, 156, or 201, 202, so two consecutive IP addresses in the system. So that's my two network adapters. But what you'll find also in this right now is it's giving me an error. Uh, where am I? It's basically telling me my internal network interface does not have a connection specific to a DNS suffix, meaning that it's looking for the DNS name of what system um, domain name should this belong to. In this case here, my company is companyabc.com. And what had happened is in my internal network um, DNS settings is I go into IPv4 under advanced under DNS is I haven't actually gone through and given it a DNS suffix. And so that's what it's, it's complaining about. It's basically saying that I don't know what domain um, this DA server is going to manage. So all I simply have to do is type in companyabc.com. And that sets the name. Go back to this. Close that out. Click it again. And that clears that error. It's now telling me effectively that um, I have IP addresses already configured, which is fine because I've already set IP addressing. But at this point here, internal, external, not giving me the DNS error. It's going to identify effectively the addressing that I need for uh, my uh, client systems, which is a 192 um, slash 48 subnet. It's now going to ask me for a certificate. What it's looking for is it's looking for effectively the encryption piece. It's looking for my root certificate um, on the system itself and the, the certificate for my DA server. So in this case here, my root certificate is cert. And for the HTTPS, it's DA1. The cert is nothing more than the root um, certifier. I'm using my own uh, Windows certificate server. Um, in this case here, this is the DA1 that was brought down to the server. Finished. That's step two. Step number three. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the question was, um, do I need IPv4 to IPv6 translation? Do, uh, where does UAG fit into place? So the, the, right now, the 6 to 4 translation is on the laptop side. So I'm going to go from IPv6 through IPv4, through the hotel or the airport or whatever's uh, internet connection, and then everything out there is going to be IPv6 on the server side. If I put UAG in place, it's still just IPv6 through the IPv4 network, but now it can communicate to IPv6 and IPv4 with the UAG. So I will always have IPv6 on my client side. So this next one, this is now section number three on this whole configuration. I need to be able to specify my network location server, and this is my server that's going to actually validate um, my, uh, my certificate, uh, abc.com. It's going to ask me to validate. Uh, actually, I'm not sure. DA1, I believe it is. And it's going to go through and check to make sure that it knows about the certificate, the certificate is trusted, um, and that the certificate is valid. So here's where this, the network location server is. Um, it's like you're currently accessible. Okay, why don't I have access to that? 
Um, maybe I haven't published it yet. Yeah, I bet I haven't published it yet. Let me go through to, oh, I don't have IS on this one. I don't have IS on that system. Let me do this one. How about this server? I don't have that one on that one. Uh, let's see. My domain controller, I think, has IIS. There you go. Um, network location server. So the NLS server, when, when your clients are roaming around, they're inside the network, and then they're outside the network. How does the laptop know whether it's inside the network or outside the network? And the way that they, they know it is through this NLS, this network location service. And what it is, it's a, it's a URL that it's going to go out and look for, effectively, a server. And that's what it's checking to be able to find out what is your network location server. When I'm inside the network, in this case here, I'm going to use my domain controller because just for the fact of, of course, my domain controller is going to be on the inside of my network. It's going to be running. And so I'm going to go through and set up a certificate inside here um, for my site. And um, what am I running on this one? What's that? Right side. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is II6, huh? <laughs> I haven't used II6 in a while. Um, OK, so uh, HTTP, there's my DC1. Um, there we go. I now have, so as I was kind of going through, my domain controller, I've now set up this DC1 certificate, so I have access to it, so that when I'm actually sitting on the inside of the network and I run Internet Explorer, I should be able to hit this server and get a valid HTTP address. So, HTTPS, dc1.companyabc.com. And if I've gone through and published this right, I get IIS 7. And you'll notice that my security is coming back as a valid certificate. If, it, uh, if I'm now on the outside of my network, on the outside of my network, that NLS server is not going to be available. That domain controller is not routed and publicly available. So what will happen is if you take your laptop, go outside the network, I'm sitting at a hotel, I'm sitting at an airport, I don't have access to this HTTPS uh, DC1. And so now the laptop's going to say, since I can't get access to NLS, that means I must be outside of the network. Therefore, let me turn on DA, direct access, and get access to direct access and communications. So that's why it's important that your direct access, if you set up a name uh, network location server, is that it's internal and it's highly available. Because if you have it internal and that, that IIS server is down, you can have a laptop sitting on the inside of your network saying, I think I'm on the outside of the network, and start loading up DA. And it'll start firing up and trying to go through and do encryption. It's not a big problem, except that you're basically going to go out of your network to come inside of your network um, to be able to go through and route through. And it comes up with some really weird route configurations on that. Can I point it to anything? Yeah, you can point it to any HTTPS uh, in your environment. And, and so as long as it is only internal, not external, and typically you want it to be something that is not something that you normally use. You wouldn't want to use an Outlook Web Access or a SharePoint server or something of that type, because when you're outside the network and you want to access it, is that you will go through the DA server to get access to SharePoint. And so you'd want to be able to have it as something that you typically don't use, a utility server. In this case here, I never use my domain controller HTTPS. So I can basically go through and set that. Um, that's why I did that, or I could use the, a name server. So now, going back to my DA server, I'm going to go through and say DC1, validate, validation successful. It's going to go through and pre-populate uh, my configuration here. So it's going to specify my uh, NLS server. It's going to specify my DA server and configuration. And there it goes. It went through and found my uh, company ABC. It identified the IPS, uh, IPv6 addressing. It identified my uh, NLS server. Um, if I'm using um, System Center Operations Manager or something to be able to monitor this, this is my management service. So this will go through and report communication errors, problems, and DA errors. Um, if you're using, and here's the thing with direct access, is that you might want to monitor your NLS server and be notified that your NLS server is up or down. You may want to be notified that the DA server is not working because if DA server is not working, users remotely can't get access to the system. And so it has actually a hook that gives you the management piece that then goes through and reports and gives you information about the status of, of what's going on in DA. So that's step number three. Step number four, 
Um, this is if I want to do end-to-end -end versus end-to-edge um, uh, configuration. I'm going to specify just the default at this point here. Two things that I now do. I'm going to hit save, which saves my configuration. And it basically saves it as a XML file. And then I say finished, which gives me a quick little review on here to say that it's gone through and configured the internal, the external, my certificates. Here's my company ABC. There's my address, my application servers. And I'm going to go through and apply that. It's very important that you hit apply. If you don't hit apply, none of this actually gets saved. And so I find a lot of times that people kind of zip through and they click on save and finished, and then they walk away from the DA server. And then they wonder why it doesn't work. Is because until you actually hit apply, none of the policy settings, none of the configurations that you just spent the last 20 minutes going through and configuring in this four-step um, configuration wizard actually gets applied. So this is setting up the certificates and setting up the encryption and things of that type. Now that I've done that, I now have direct access configured and running. So let me go through and to my slides. So I've done the configuration settings. I've added the direct access feature on the system. Um, now I want to make sure that my direct access system works. So that's a helpful thing. So I'm going to go to my Windows 7 client. I'm going to do GP uh, update slash force. Once again, make sure that um, I got the policies in place. A lot of times, this is also a good place to reboot things. Um, if, you, if you go through and run GP update force, it forces all the policies. Remember, I made quite a few policy changes. I went through and created a group. I created a certificate policy. I created a configuration policy. I, I created a direct access policy. So the systems I would reboot would be my DA server and my Windows 7 server, uh, or my Windows 7 client systems. So that way, when I log back in, all the policies are, are fresh, and I know the thing has applied the configuration settings. I'm going to be lazy. I'm going to give it a shot, see if it works. If it doesn't work, you'll see me reboot my computer systems in about five minutes. Um, but then, again, that's one of those things of reboot is usually your friend in, in going through the process if, if things don't work. Don't start unconfiguring stuff until you actually reboot your systems. So I am, at this point, going to go through and access A server. I'm going to get access to um, drive shares. So I have access effectively to my internal resources. What I'm now going to go through and do is set it up and I'm going to move my Windows 7 client system, which is currently on my internal network, and I'm going to move it over to my public network. I'm going to go back to that Windows 7 system. Control panel network. I'm going to change the IP address from the system from an internal IP address, 192.168.3.102, to an external address because I'm now on the public network. I did this right, this system should now be, oops, ah. twelve dot one fifty five dot one sixty six dot one. No, it's not coming again. I ping twelve one. My name server is currently on the internal network. I configured my name server to be on the internal network initially, so that way I can get all the certificates across. So now I'm going to move my name server out to the public network. There we go. Now I should be able to ping my name server. 12.15.166.1. Yeah. I also probably think the firewall might be on too. Let's see if we can ping the other direction. 
Yeah. Okay. So I'm on the same segment. I just wanted to double check back and forth to make sure that both my name server and my uh, Windows 7 workstation is on the remote system, uh, which it is. And now. It's typo. A, B, C. Okay. Uh, 12, 155, 166, 4, and my DNS is 12, 155, 166, 1. I'm sorry? No, oh, thanks, yeah, I'm going to give that a try. Yeah, for some reason, 192.200. Oh, you know what? I, I have my um, DNS is not set right or my IPv6 is not set right. I moved my device to the outside, but I didn't configure my, yeah, there it is. Uh, now IP config, flush DNS, and ping 12.155.166.1. Uh, 12, con, con, one. Talk to me. I'm going to go through the rest of my slides. I'll come back to that. Let's wait for a second and think through it. Um, it, I got some real basic networking. I can't even get to my local server, which is um, not a direct access thing. It's, it's back to my configuration. Um, finally, finalize the configuration um, and settings on the system itself. So testing direct access, and, and this is something I'll come back to in, in about five minutes here, and I'll let my brain kind of rethink through this, and I'll go back and look at the configurations. These are typical um, configuration settings. You want to ping, you want to do DNS configuration settings and things of that type. Make sure that you have connectivity between your device and your systems themselves. Um, testing it externally is that when you take that mobile device and you move it to the outside of your firewall, what I'm not getting is I'm not getting an IP address on the outside, so I've got some real basic networking. I'm not connecting to that 12 uh, dot network, um, and, and it's probably something very simple I'm overlooking here as I'm kind of thinking too fast. So I'll go through that configuration, but you can do things like um, NetShell to be able to go through and figure out uh, the DNS settings and configuration states of the system itself. And then you could go through and test out uh, the different routing protocols. Now, one of the things that, that I talked about was um, the biggest challenge that you run into other than kind of typoing and, and doing things uh, without kind of thinking through the configurations. And again, follow the steps and, and test through things is that the thing that, that trips people up is the whole transition tr um, protocols. Teredo, ISOTAP, 6 to 4, IP HTTPS. These are all the different protocols that basically are created. They're automatically installed on your Windows 7 clients. It effectively takes your IPv6 shoves it through an ITP v4 network, so that way when you're sitting at a hotel or an airport or whatever, and you get an IP4 network, is that you're running IPv6, you gotta take that uh, IPv6 and shove it through an IPv4 network. So these are the different things that it does. It, it either tries to communicate through IPv6, if you're sitting at a hotel or airport that didn't give you an IPv6 address, then you're not gonna get an IPv6 address to be able to go through and communicate. So then it's going to try Teredo, and then it's going to try Isotap, then it's going to try 6 to 4, and then it's going to try eventually IP HTTPS. Let me explain to you what those different protocols are. So 6 to 4 is effectively, it's a, it's a standard that they have out um, for IPv6 in, in translations. It basically takes an IPv6 address, squirts it down into an IPv4 address, and passes it through. It works great as long as your network on either side is not running NAT. Now, when have you gone to a hotel and they didn't use NAT? When have you gone to an airport and they didn't use NAT, right? And so everywhere you go, NAT is used. And so the six to four sounds like a great idea, but at the end of the day, it never works because unless you actually get a, a native IP address out on the public internet, which you never do when you go to a hotel or what have you in Rome, is that that protocol doesn't work. So off the list, um, doesn't work in the real world. 
Another thing that, that is available then is if it doesn't work six to four, it's then going to go through and, and use Teredo. Pareto works great in an environment because it supports NAT transversal. So as long as I get an IP address um, using NAT, I can now use Teredo where I couldn't use 6 to 4. But what Teredo does use is use a UDP as part of the um, translation for the 6 to 4. Now, most of the times when you go to a hotel or an airport or whatever, while they might give you an IP address, they many times won't go through and, and allow you to transmit over UDP. Same places that prevent you from using point-to-point -point tunneling, RDP. You know, they're going to lock it down so you only have port 80, port 443 for TCP IP, and they're not necessarily going to go through and allow you UDP. So Teredo sounds great. It allows me to do NAT, but in the end of the day, I typically find one out of 10 places that I go, UDP is not enabled, Teredo doesn't work. Next. Isotap, another type of standard that's available that allows you to go through and do IPv6 to IPv4 translation. We typically find that ISOTAP is a better protocol for conversion when you're doing site-to-site -site, uh, communications. So if you have a site in San Francisco and a site in New York City, and you want to be able to go through IPv6 on both sides, but you want to go through IPv4 through your internet provider, ISOTAP is a great protocol for that, because you can set up effectively a, an RAS server, a gateway server, that does six to four over the internet from point to point. When you start doing ISOTAP in a large-scale environment, you know, like Windows uh, 7 for direct access, and you got 100, 200, 300 client sessions that are using ISOTAP. The overhead on ISOTAP gets to the point where you start running into performance and throttling problems on the network. And so it works. Um, there's no question that when you set it up, um, you're configuring it for one or two users and you're fiddling around with it. More than likely, it's going to try 6 to 4 and fail. It's going to try NAT and it's going to fail, uh, or um, uh, Teredo and fail. It will connect through ISOTAP, but it's one of those things from a scalability standpoint, we typically find that. The, uh, the protocol that works the best is IP HTTPS. This is where our, um, you know how uh, Outlook uses the whole um, Outlook Anywhere, uh, R, uh, RPC over HTTPS. Microsoft came up with that uh, 10 years ago where it basically took RPC, shoved it into an HTTPS packet, sent it over port 443. That's effectively what they're doing in the way of IP HTTPS. Um, basically in that environment, it doesn't matter whether you're running NAT, it doesn't matter whether you're running uh, in an environment that uh, is blocking UDP um, in the way of the standards, it's going through and configuring it for, uh, to go over port 443. When I blogged about IP HTTPS, I got slammed by all the IPv6 purists, basically saying, oh, Microsoft, once again, is screwing with the standards. Um, but at the end of the day, this protocol works because I can basically travel anywhere, and as long as they open up port 443, I have access and the communications are set up. Now, in order for you to be able to do IP HTTPS, you need to use certificates, which that's why we went the whole rigor mole of going through and setting up the certificates on the configuration um, and using a CRL. This is basically going to go through and validate using the HTTPS out to a, a um, certificate revocation list to be able to see if you have a certificate uh, access to that. If you have that, this works. From a scalability standpoint, it's pushing everything through 443. It doesn't put a lot of payload in the traffic. It basically tunnels it through. Um, and you know, from a day-to-day from a -day basis, when I actually go through my system and I'm traveling, I'll typically find that nine times out of 10, I'm actually connecting through IP HTTPS anyways, because I'm, my NAT's being blocked, my UDP's being blocked, um, and I want to be able to go through and scale. So kind of throw that out there as, from a configuration standpoint, those are the different standards. And you'll actually be able to see it on the monitoring tool, actually I'll show you right here, is that what will happen is that when you're actually running direct access, Remember in, in the configuration on the uh, direct access server, I had the option of selecting either setup or monitoring. So this is the second tab under monitoring. It'll actually show you, in this case here, um, that ISOTAP is current configured and running. Um, and ITP HTTPS is when it starts seeing traffic going back and forth, that little thing lights up green. Um, the only thing that you, yellow, and this is kind of misleading, yellow is not bad. Yellow means that it's running, but nothing's going over it right now. Um, so the only thing that you really don't want in this screen is a red. Red basically means that the, the network link is down. So if you see a network link on, say, 6 to 4 or Teredo or something as red, that means you have a configuration problem typically. But as long as it's yellow, it means that it's working. And when it's green, it means traffic is actually flowing through that um, connection port um, through a DA service. Now you could go through the monitoring on that. All right, the next section gets into direct access, so let me... Take a deep breath, and we'll go figure out what I did here. All right, so on my Windows 7 client. 
default gateway for IPv4. Um, what did I actually specify on this thing? Server 12.156.1.1. Actually, I don't need the gateway on that. And one. Uh, yeah, this one I think is set for public network. And this one is set for public network, so they're on the same network. I'm sorry? Firewall. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking right now is my firewall might be enabled and, and which is not going to allow me to let me go through and do this. CRL dot company. <laughs> yeah, turn it off. Company ABC dot com slash um, cert dot CRL. Yeah, it's communicating with the system. And my DA1 is 12.155.166.2. Oh. Uh, DA1, colon, colon, one. And um, my CRL, 12, colon, colon, one. And my CRL is on two. And my NLS, 12, colon, colon, one. Let me see if I can get access through IP 12, colon, colon, one, that two. I will futz with that in a bit here. Yeah. I can't even get access to my local server. I'm going to go through and reboot. <laughs> I did say that, that if it didn't work after five minutes, I'm going to reboot. So there we go. I'm going to go through and reboot this thing. Everything is set up right, so it, it could be that just the configuration settings weren't didn't take and, and reset. So as far as I can tell, everything looks like it's, it's configured right. All right. We'll let that thing go through and reboot. We'll see where it goes. All right. Um, so imagine that you actually see it working and uh, the configuration setting is, is uh, going through. Now, with the, the basic direct access server in place, what you're going to end up getting is that my laptop system is going to be able to hit my DA server, get access to any IPv6 servers that are out here, so any of my Windows 2008, 2008 R2 servers that I've gone through and set up IPv6. That's why it's important that as you go through this whole process is that you get an IPv6 scheme going. And, and back to that blog that I've gone through and created, is I've created a blog, I've kind of walked through the process of uh, how do you go through and do an IPv6 naming um, numbering scheme, how do you apply the IPv6 addresses uh, to the system? How do you set up DHCP to be able to do the IPv6 uh, addressing as well? So I go through that all through that blog posting, but that basically now provides me access from this uh, Windows 7 workstation to any of the IPv6 servers that are on my back end, which will work fine for Exchange and SharePoint and some of the new stuff that you have out there. But what do you do about environments where you don't have IPv6 systems in place and you effectively in those environments have IPv4 systems? 
So this might be your old file and print server. This might be your old SharePoint 2007 server. This might be an accounting application server that's currently running Great Plains 7 that's running on Windows 2003 and SharePoint 2003. You're not going to be able to hit that externally through direct access because they're not running IPv6. That's where your direct access server comes into play, is that your direct access server allows you to be able to have remote access into these systems. Another thing that direct access provides is the ability for you to be able to access those back-end resources from non-Windows 7 clients. So up until now, I've been talking about direct access, which only runs on Windows 7 systems, is that what if I had a Mac? What if I had an iPad? What if I had a Windows Vista system? How do I get access to my Exchange server or my file and print service and things of that type? And what the UAG server is, it's an SSL VPN. It basically allows me to log in type in my login name and password to the UAG server from Mac OS, Linux OS, and that passes my information and gives me file access uh, into my system and set up uh, that direction. So effectively, it gives me um, the ability to go through and set up uh, access to my IPv4 and gives me access to uh, from non-Microsoft Windows-based systems. Uh, my build. Um, installing and configuring UAG. And... Um, So as that thing is booting up, I'm going to go into this UAG screen. So in this um, system, what I've gone through is I've created a uh, system where I also have in this environment one internal network address, 192.168.310, and I have the pair of external addresses, 12.152.166.10 and 11. Um, so same type of configuration settings as I have for my DA server. Um, in the UAG management, and when you go through and set up the, the UAG server, you shove the CD in, it takes about 45 minutes, a very long installation for setting up UAG. So I went through and pre-installed uh, the configuration for uh, UAG. Here's those HTTPS connections. So this is if I want to go through and create what we call HTTPS trunks. This is ability for me to be able to do the SSL VPN. I can set up file shares, I can set remote printing, things of that type, so a user can connect to, effectively, the UAG server from a non-Windows-based computer, get access to file shares. I'm going to go through and skip that configuration piece and go to the direct access, kind of the, the purpose of this session here. And in the direct access configuration is that the actual configuration screen in this uh, direct access uh, configuration is the exact same configuration process as you've gone through and have done for uh, direct access a few moments ago. Go through and toggle. Okay, my Windows 7 system is up. My name server is up, and my DA server is up. Okay. Um, yeah, let me do this. It's. Let me try one more time on my Windows 7 system. And the reason why I'm going to go through and test this is um, in order for me to be able to bring up the UAG server, I'm actually going to go through and bring down my direct access server. So I'm actually going to flip-flop uh, in that environment because I'm going to basically do a direct replacement of taking my DA server out of the environment and bring a UAG server. But before I do that, let me do one more try to make sure that uh, I can see if I can get DA to work here. Ah, that's something I didn't get last time. So see, I had basic networking problem. It now I actually found a network. That is helpful. <laughs> so I'm sure it was a, a policy that needed to be reconfigured. Let me see. The location settings? Yeah, you changed the settings. Yeah, yeah, you know, I went through and changed my network ad uh, adapter settings and probably flushed the DNS and a few other things that, you know, didn't go through, so.
as an address. I'll go through and fiddle that with UAG in a bit here. So let me go through and, and drop my uh, DA server. And save the configuration. I'll get back to that at the, uh, at the next step here. So in the UAG components of this, is that what it's going to come up back is, is going to say that I acknowledge that there's a um, DA server in place. Do you want to proceed? I'm going to go through and click Next. What you'll find in the UAG configuration is that the actual screen that is used in the uh, DA configuration or the UAG configuration is the exact same screen. So I can go through and configure my clients and my GPOs. I configure my direct access server in step number two. In step number three, I go through and do the infrastructure services as well as the end-to-end -end access. So all the step-by-step -step processes that I go through and, and went and configured uh, when I went through and did the uh, configuration for direct access, I go through and follow that exact same procedures inside uh, the UAG server. Um, and just I'm going to kind of zip quick through uh, the configurations on this is that it's going to basically allow me to use uh, direct access configurations. It identifies my domain. And remember the last time I had to go through and create all of those group policies and settings and things of that type? Is that UAG actually, this is a service pack one of UAG. So when they released, direct access released, UAG released, and they've now have come out with UAG service pack one. And what they've done in service pack one is they've included now a number of these different um, uh, group policies so that you actually don't manually have to go through and set the policies. So typically what I'll say for organizations is that if you're thinking about setting up direct access and you know that you're going to have to use IPv4 servers on the back end, is that on the back end servers um, that, that are already IPv4, set the configuration settings so you build UAG from the get-go. You can set direct access, but then if you do like I just did here, I set direct access, and then I put UAG on top of that um, in the system, is I'm kind of duplicating and replicating some of the different functions. If I know from the, the get-go I'm, I'm going to need access to IPv4, I'm going to put IP, uh, the UAG server in place. So it sets the policies. Um, add in my groups. And same thing for the configuration. Now I'm not going to go through and walk through the process uh, and step by step on this one, but just kind of walk through the, the steps. It's going to ask us all this exact same thing, the network addresses for the internal facing, the addresses for the external facing, click next, go through the next settings and configuration settings on that. So effectively what I'm going to get out of, out of configuring UAG is the same thing as I did when I used direct access as part of that whole step-by-step um, -step configuration. As you'll notice here, I'll basically say same steps as before for steps 8 through 11 uh, for the configuration uh, uh, basis. Additional base, uh, benefits for using UAG, Windows 7 clients now have access to servers that aren't IPv6, so this would be your I or older servers, and XP clients, Mac clients, Linux clients can go through and do SSL VPN access into the system itself. Now, I talked about the three different configurations. I have end-to-end, end-to-edge, um, and the end-edge with, uh, with the end-to-end -end, uh, configuration for encryption, is that in that one step, step number uh, four, is I have the ability of specifying what type of uh, encryption that I want to be able to go through and set up. If I want to be able to do that end-to-end -end authentication encryption uh, specifications, I only chose the first one, which kind of gave me the simple configuration. If I choose the second one, now I'm actually going to go through and set up IPsec end-to-end. I'm using the same certificates that I created on my clients and my DA server, except now I'm actually going to use those certificates all the way back to my application servers and set up the encryption from the endpoints uh, on the system itself. Testing out the end-to-end -end encryption piece, um, going back into the firewall settings, I can actually test the configurations in Windows 7. So when I go to my Windows system, uh, control panel, system, firewall, in advanced settings, is that on, on your actual uh, Windows 7 clients, there's a monitoring function. And this will actually tell you um, from a uh, configuration settings is that the firewall is running, um, whether you're transmitting information back and forth um, using the direct access, um, and it's passing information through the firewall. So you'll start seeing within there the local addresses of the different devices that you're connected to. So if you're actually doing end-to-end -end connection, you'll actually see there the IPv6 addresses of the endpoints that you're communicating with, whether it's file servers, um, exchange servers, SharePoint servers, and things of that type uh, within that configuration. Diagnostics. So going through the debugging process and configuration, as I always go through this uh, process, as you start off building the, the server, you'll find that many times you'll be making some typo configurations, and you'll probably find that that's probably half of the things that I've kind of came up with 
is I didn't go through and share drive share. I didn't go through and set up stuff. I always methodically say use the, the guidance um, step by step. You read through it. Make sure that when you select the firewall settings that you go through the, the settings to open up the ports as opposed to the default click, click, and click. There's a number of things that you can also go through and do. There's actually a uh, net sh uh, trace command that will allow you to go through and trace the communications from end to end to be able to find out are you actually communicating from your end client all the way into your direct access server. Um, there's another thing that's actually going to be done uh, to, on Thursday at 2.45 p.m. There's going to be a how to troubleshoot direct access. There's another uh, uh, level 400 session that's actually going to go through the process of now that you have direct access working, how do you go through and debug uh, and problem solve? So what I typically would suggest is that's one session to be able to go to. Also, there's a session going on tomorrow, troubleshooting UAG in 45 minutes flat. It's kind of an interactive session uh, that's going to be available for you to be able to ask questions. So that's tomorrow at 1.30 in the afternoon. If any of you are actually looking to be able to play with direct access, rather than going back to your home or labs and be able to set it up, uh, there's actually a, um, a direct access hands-on lab available for you uh, downstairs um, for you to be able to go through. It's, it's not available? It's not? OK. They killed the, the lab. So anyways, you do have my instructions for the process to be able to go through and build out the configuration settings. Let me hit a couple of the, the house cleaning uh, keeping slides, and I'll go through and uh, answer questions. So try, and then I'll also go through and try to debug this thing, too. Track resources, variety of different uh, resources on the web available, uh, resources on TechEd, and uh, fill out your evaluation forms, complete the little forms, and for the evals, if you can go through and please fill out the evals. Hopefully this information was helpful. Sorry, I actually didn't get that one piece working. I'm going to sit here and, and try to figure out what basic uh, uh, networking thing that I'm missing here on the configuration. I'll post it in my blog to be able to tell you what I actually did wrong in the setups. I know it's something simple. Um, but hopefully you'll be able to download all of the content that I have, both the demo scripts as well as the white paper guides uh, that will walk you through this process. And if you have any questions, I'm up on Network World as my blog. Please post information. I have several blog postings on IPv6. I have several postings on uh, direct access. And you can post to any of those. I'll be glad to go through and collaborate and, and help out and answer any questions. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll take questions uh, as.